everyone. Thank you. If councillors could take their seats, please. Um, I'd just like to uh, begin uh, our session this morning uh, by introducing uh, Nate uh, Turner, who is a student at Middleton Grange. Uh, and uh, he wrote to me um, a great letter talking about um, various issues and passions that he has. And uh, he was very interested in the role of the mayor and the role of council and um, decisions that we make. Uh, he was born here in Christchurch. Um, unfortunately, he's moved out to the Selwyn District uh, <laughs> Council area in the meantime, but I'm sure he's desperate to get back to Christchurch City. And um, so uh, I've invited him to shadow me for um, some of today, and, uh, but he's also going to shadow Anne Galloway, who's uh, going out to uh, another function shortly out at uh, Hallswall. A junior council initiative. A junior council initiative, initiative out at Hallswall. And so Nate's going to accompany Anne and then come back and join me at the table. So he's chosen a very good day to come here and uh, learn about um, how local processes work. So thank you and, and welcome, Nate. So if we could start with um, public participation. The first one uh, is from uh, Jessica Halliday, the director of FESTA. Um, and uh, welcome, Jessica. Uh, Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making. I'm here this morning with our board chair, Mike Fisher, who's behind us. Note he's here in his personal capacity as a trustee rather than a staff member. And two of the FESTA team, Kai Hitchcock and Emma Johnson. We welcome this opportunity to speak to you this morning about FESTA 2018, <coughs> which is due to take place at Labour Weekend, bringing thousands back into the central city. This biennial festival of urban creativity had its inaugural event in 2012, and on the 19th to the 22nd of October this year, we'll present our fifth festival. FESTA brings a fresh energy and life back into the city, as thousands of Cantabrians, as well as visitors, flood into the central city. Our 2016 event brought 16,000 people back in over six hours. Um, oh, can I? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so there's kind of two streams of events at FESTA. There's our headline event where we work with a score of architecture and design students from Australia and New Zealand who design and fabricate temporary works of architecture and with the help of local construction companies. Put them up in vacant sites and public spaces of the city and then local artists and businesses and musicians activate this temporary cityscape with all kinds of activities. And we invite the public to come down and enjoy it. Um, and then two, really two, and then we have a other stream of activity with over 50 events happening over Labour Weekend. Um, two things change with every festa. One is the theme of the event, and this year our theme is the relationship between food and the city. So this year festa is a festival of architecture, design and food. Our headline event is called Festa. Um, on the 20th of October from the 5th to the, uh, from 5 to 11 p.m., and we have five different focus areas for um, the event. The other thing that changes with our major event is the location. And this year we are activating a little known part of the city, AKA the South Frame, specifically um, the area around Mollet Street and Matai Common. So we want thousands of people of Christchurch to, in, to enjoy and experience this new public space that can become part of their future lives. So we're working with seven schools of architecture and design from across Australia and New Zealand, seven. Um, they're gonna create original installations and I'll give you a sneak peek of some of them. This is the University of Adelaide. It's called Little Asia, a pop-up night food market that involves international students in Adelaide and international students in Christchurch working with our assistant director, Erica Austin, and they're activating it with cultural performances. Uh, UCS in Sydney are creating a unique bamboo architecture for feasting. Uh, the University of Auckland is creating two pieces of mobile architecture. One of them is this, an organic pod for um, public feasting. Uh, Massey's College of Creative Arts is creating, working with an incredible local business, the Beer Fillery Punky Brewster, to create a bar of the future. 
And um, the University of Technology, their interior design studio, is creating this display of food products from across Canterbury, highlighting local cottage e industries. And there's going to be some form of exchange involved where people record their local food memories in return for some of this produce. For the first time ever at FESTA, we have local architects and designers actually working with us, not just students. Um, this is made possible by the New Zealand Institute of Architects um, and one of our Dynamo sponsors, Metalcraft Roofing. And this is one of their projects, Sounds Like Dinner, which is an audio-visual experience. And the third's created by Landscape Architects. And also at FESTA this year, we have original work by four artists across a variety of artistic practice, dance movement, contemporary Māori um, art, craft, and contemporary performance. I'll turn briefly to the wider program. There's 54 different events over the weekend happening uh, across 27 different <coughs> venues uh, across the city, most in the central city, and over 50 different individuals and groups are helping us produce these. Um, they do all the work, we just umbrella it and promote it. I'll highlight just one of them. It's a major national symposium called Food in the City that's hosted by Simon Wilson of the New Zealand Herald and features Rod Oram and other local um, experts and national experts on food and food systems. That's entirely free and happens on Sunday the 21st of October. And if you want to know more about the other 53 events in the programme, please come to our <coughs> programme launch, which is a week uh, tonight, 5.30. At Space Academy, you've all been invited. Thank you to those of you who've given us apologies and to Councillor Templeton for your RSVP. So how do we make it all happen? Well, we couldn't do it without all those collaborators and participants, but we couldn't do it without our family of supporters. Council are our FESTA champion. Um, we are supported through the Events and Festivals Fund, uh, but we have our FESTA Dynamos, Metalcraft, Lewis Bradford do all our engineering pro bono, and this year our delivery partner on the ground is City Care who are a great fit for FESTA. They're a like-minded team of people who are passionate about the local community and design education. Our lead Fest, uh, FESTA community partner this year is the Food Resilience Network, who are helping us reach and educate more people about issues to do with food in the city that rel relate to resilience. We also seek uh, support from the public. Um, our headline event is entirely free to the public, but we use crowdfunding to allow the public to talk to us and to give us some portia to, um, through crowdfunding, thank you, Councillor Swiggs, for your donation. Um, so what can you do as Mayor and Councillors for FESTA? Well, the most important Wrapping is that it you up, can... Jessica, sorry. You can help us get excited, <laughs> use your networks to spread news about FESTA. You've got great networks. Share information about our crowdfunding. And if you aren't going away over Labor Weekend, please join us at FESTA. And all go around. Pledge me. Correct. Yes, right. <coughs> That's correct. Thank you Join very much. Thanks. Thanks. Kia ora. Thank, Kia ora. You. Thank you. Right. Uh, the next one is uh, Warwick Schaefer representing Christchurch Coastal Residents United, presenting a deputation on item nine, notice for motion. Yeah. I can see it in front of me here. Yeah. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to stay, are you, uh, for the for the discussion on the because I was I'm going to defer the item till later on this afternoon. I have, I'm afraid I have to go. Yeah. So that that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it will be online. <laughs> so um, there it is. Um, okay. Thank you for the invite today. Oh, I'm here in support of a motion being put by Young Yu Hansen to correct a problem in the district plan and want to just explain a little bit of background behind that and to beseech you all um, to please support it <coughs> because correcting this thing is the right thing to do and you will uh, be saving a lot of people from a lot of angst and grief that we've had because of this to this point. So um, we're very familiar with it and the Coastal Councillors are probably very familiar with what's happened here. I've been asked to perhaps give a little bit of background for those that are on the other side of town and maybe this is not so familiar. Um, I guess every part of town has its huge problems. I understand the oil has, has a great quarry gobbling it up. Um, 
this is our huge problem on the coastal side of town. If you can relate it to something, it's a big issue for you. Um, it's to do with coastal hazards. It goes right back to the beginning of the coastal hazards process where um, there were three hazards, uh, inundation, erosion, and flooding. Um, you may remember a big thing a few years ago where that was taken out of the fast track process. Um, the community opposed it on the grounds that um, fast track was all about earthquake related issues, whereas this was global warming. It's a long onset issue. We have time to think about it and do it right. So those provisions were taken out of fast track um, where there's not much time to think about things and do things well. Um, however, one of the aspects of that was left in, which was flooding. Um, and there is some argument to say that flooding should have stayed in. Um, Post-earthquake, rivers have changed and so forth, and there, I think, arguably is reason to quickly deal with some of those issues. But unfortunately, the sea level, level rise component was left in with that also. So the council uh, proposed that buildings should be non-compliant in all these areas uh, that would be affected by both flooding plus a metre of sea level rise. That covered an enormous area, like almost a third of the east of the city. Um, and non-compliance, you say these planning terms quickly, you it's hard to sort of understand what that really means on the ground, I think. It's, it's one of those technical terms that doesn't mean much, but it really, I think, to sort of paint the picture for you, um, you look at a suburb or a house that's a bit small, you're a young family, you have a dream of maybe adding a room for your child. Uh, well, that's not possible when building is not non-compliant. You can't extend your house. Or you might find a, a section that a house has been bowled after earthquake and think, oh, I'll rebuild there. That's not possible. And so that's hugely impactful for those people directly involved, but it ripples out through an entire suburb. It, you, you know, a, a suburb that has a sort of a policy like this on it is really, you know, you can't invest in it. A, 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 su a suburb that can't be invested in can't grow. It's, there's only one direction for this. It's extremely severe, and we're starting to see that <coughs> out on right and south shore now where this has uh, progressed further than anywhere else. It's, it's, it's a very severe and quite ugly thing and the stories we've had to sit and listen to of severe loss at, at personal levels, like some people $20,000, $30,000 just gone, that will never come back just trying to get through planning to build a house that they cannot actually build at the moment because of this mistake in the plan. So um, the map up here is what's called the residential unit overlay, these little speckles of yellow. There was a process through the fast track called the independent hearing panel. Now, you, people here probably know what that's all about, but essentially for everyone else, it's um, a panel of three high court judges in a very rigorous process that we all went through where the council put their best experts, their best lawyers, all the evidence supporting the idea that buildings should be non-compliant in these areas. We came... We put opposing evidence to the panel, which was, this is too harsh, there are too many uncertainties, the costs are too high, there are better ways. And the, pa the panel listened to that and asked the, the council to go away and draw up some new rules, which are called re restricted discretionary. So you can build under certain caveats, certain things that, that preserve life and limb and property. If you tick these things off, you're able to build your house. And um, the council, uh, the, the panel itself didn't have really a drafting service, so they asked the council to do it. And this is a sort of, see how we go here with this. Um, if someone else can help me move on to the next one. I'll just try myself. Get my hand off. The councils, the councils have got it in front on the hub. Yeah. Um, so the council was asked to act as a, a drafting service for the panel, which was essentially to draw up this restricted discretionary area. Um, and they did it in areas that would be only afflicted, affected by uh, sea level rise. So these areas are not at flood risk currently. They would only be at flood risk at some point, a long time into the future, 
if these scenarios come through, there's so many ifs. Right now, there's high and dry. You're quite safe to build a house there right now. Um, so they've drafted these plans and the uh, council did it under duress because this is not what the council wanted at the time. Um, and so they said you should follow the panel's instructions and then have a then you would have a chance at the end to voice their concerns through policy riders so they could make that clear. So that was the process. Now, the next slide uh, is shows the result of that and where some things have somehow gone wrong a little bit. Um, now, we're asking that there be an inquiry into how this happened, because actually it's not 100% sure what's gone wrong here. We know it's wrong because recently a letter came out from the judge who was chairing that panel saying what it is like now is not how we intended it. So just to take you back to this, um, there's a little clause in here that I'll read out to you uh, on the the version put to the IHP by the CCC at the hearing. So this is the version written under duress to allow building in these areas. Um, A, provide for development for a residential unit on residentially zoned land where appropriate mitigation can be provided that protects people's safety, well-being, and property, and in all other cases, avoid subdivision, etc. Now, that's the panel asked council to write that as a service, but the council's position at the time, uh, it possibly still is, uh, was that they didn't want that, they didn't want building. So they had their own version, which was, um, is on the left here, which doesn't have this provision about residential, provide for residential development. Um, and that's, I want to stress that that's not wrong. Of course they have their position. Um, and the problem that has happened somehow is the council's position got into the final version and the panel wasn't, how can I say, not notified or didn't notice or something went wrong that the wrong version went into the plan. They wanted the left-hand version here. The right-hand version got there. So now you have planners who all they see is avoid development when they look at the plan. And effectively, you've got the result of what was originally wanted, which was non-compliance. Um, now, it wasn't completely certain up until recently that this was a problem. The council stance was, well, the panel would have noticed. They must have published this. They must have wanted it. Mm. A, a letter has come out from the judge, Hassan, um, Hanson, sorry, saying this is not our intention. We absolutely intended this uh, residential discretionary part to go in. The actual rule that went with that went in, the maps went in, it's just this policy bit, this three lines that got missed out. Um, and I have the rule actually on the next slide just to show you, if you s click to that. Um, now, I'm not going to read it out to you. I'm just going to say that the rule itself is in the plan. Mm. It's just completely incongruous that you would have no policy that would actually enable that rule. It's obviously wrong, it, even before we got the letter from the judge, but that just cements it. So Yanni's uh, motion today is about starting the process to correct that. Now, that might be order in council. It might be going to the government through section 17, we're not quite sure yet, but we need to urgently fix it. Um, this has been a torrid time, this whole process for council, for community, for staff. I think everybody involved is up to here with coastal hazards. And I'm really hoping that this could be a turning point to doing things better and right. Thank you. Look, you've just come perfectly to the end of the 10 minutes that was allocated. Uh, last night I thought you didn't think that you would um, be able to, to fill in 10 minutes, but you have admirably, and I'm glad you've written in the rule. I'm glad you've identified the problem very clearly, which is, um, does the policy support the rule that was clearly decided by the independent hearings panel? And I think when we get to Yanni's um, uh, notice of motion later on today, 
uh, will be able to. Um, but I, can I reassure you that we that this isn't the start of the process. We've been on to this, and I have to say the release of the the judge's letter has actually enabled me to find where the you know the sequence of events, how it's happened, um, and now we need to focus on fixing it. So um, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the um, the next set of public um, uh, deputations. Uh, the first of which is Aaron Campbell on council priorities for capital acceleration fund item 24. Aaron's um, supporting documents on the hub if you want to follow that. Right, Aaron. Good morning, Council. Heiaha te me nui o te ao, maku e kiatu. You know how the rest of that ends. Uh, today I'll focus on three things in this deputation. It's on the Christchurch Regeneration Acceleration Facility. Luckily it's not called a plan because that wouldn't be a craft anymore would be something else. One, the first thing that I'll focus on is council process. The second thing is attachment B, which uh, is my kind of uh, supported documentation. The third is a comparison of options based um, on the four well-beings that you've been presented um, as a council. But before I begin on that, I want to draw your attention to Schedule 5, Paragraph A of the Cost Sharing Agreement that was signed in 2013 and had council and crown contributions for the stadium split at 50-50. And I don't even know why we're talking about the stadium in the, the CRAM, the CRAF, when it's in the CSA. I that don't was, know if we... That's the one that had a $216 million to be determined. That's correct, yes. But as um, paragraph A says, the stadium will be built as per the CCRP with private sector funding and or 50-50 Crown CCC contribution of, for the balance. The CCC's contribution will be capped at 253. But coming back to the agenda item 24 today, in August of 2017, this is what Canterbury heard announcing today that we will provide a $300 million capital acceleration fund for Canterbury and its rebuild. You and your city know exactly what your priorities are, and that is why you will decide how that $300 million is spent. The city will decide. The council has just submitted, uh, just consulted on its LTP. The consulta consultation document said that the capital acceleration facility has not been included in the LTP. And at the time of print, it also quotes, the government is reviewing Metro Sports and the stadium, and again, this is not factored into the plan. In the agenda item under significance, 2.1.2, the proposals of in this paper were not explicitly part of the 2018 LTP consultation. Key points 4.3, the Crown has been consistent that appropriate due process for allocation of Crown funding should be followed. That's supported with note three. Note three, note three links to Minister Dr. Megan Woods in May of this year. Quote, local decision makers will be front and center because they know what's best for Christchurch. My primary question to you today is, are you adhering to the Local Government Act under the principles of consultation? If you move this agenda item today, is council going to be responsible for any cost overruns? Because there's no longer a partnership with the Crown. The second point that I want to uh, bring up today is attachment B of the Craft Stadium proposal. So it lists the cost elements of three options. 
And as we know, the pre-feasibility study of the multi-use arena that was released in August of 2017 had four options. So what three are we talking about here? Thankfully, Michael Hayward of Fairfax yesterday shed some light on that. So option three here is now the same as option three in the pre-feasibility study. Now, option three has been the hot choice all year from my understanding. Um, however, a general manager is quoted in this article saying now option two is the preferred choice. So where, where did the swerve happen here? Council is now saying that you want a clone of Forsyth Bar. There's no retractable pitch. There's no 100% natural turf. Is that what we're deciding on here? And my question is, how was this decided? In the attachment, I want to draw your attention. So this is the supporting documentation. It's on page two. The significant challenges to achieving financial viability of stadiums. Now, refer to page two on funding options. This includes in the pre-feasibility study the risks of debt funding, the risks of pre-sales as a funding option, and private sector interest in investment and development risk for the council as the precinct owner. Now. Let me be clear, Christchurch needs a new stadium, but the process has to be in, the process has to be correct. We do need a new stadium, but the process has to be correct. The third and final point that I want to raise is the options that you have had, um, that you have in front of you here today. The Otakaro Avon River Corridor. The green spine is half of the 600 hectare residential red zone. It's an $800 million project. It says in the documents here today that the economic benefits are $2.9 billion. There's a increase in private property values of $1.5 billion. There's flood protection for 4,000 homes. There's going to be a million unique visitors supporting the regeneration of East Christchurch. And to quote, to realize these and other environmental cultural and community benefits, effective delivery of the plan will be crucial. And specifically ensuring that there is sufficient funding in the early stages, particularly for the green spine. But you're saying here today, in these documents, or, count, uh, or staff are bringing uh, the, the agenda to you today, saying that 13% of the CRAF is all it's worth right now. How does that balance with the four well-beings? Heaha te mianui o te ao, maku e kiatu, he tangata. You should decide. You should decide. He tangata, he tangata. Thank you. Hey, thanks for that, Aaron. Um, I'm just looking at the Labour Party's website and their policy on Christchurch and the 300 million capital acceleration fund specifically mentions that it sh uh, the red zone could contribute towards the new stadium and deal with gaps in the hor horizontal infrastructure as part of the global sediment. So there's obviously two things that they're, they're, um, they're meaning there, but they specifically are spelling out the things that they wanted. So obviously there might be a difference between what was said and what's actually the policy. <coughs> So tell Wellington that this is Christchurch and that we want to decide what we want to spend this money that they promised. And also there's a hundred million dollars there for um, public transport as well. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, now, I'm, at the moment, I'm, uh, my name's Richard Peebles, and I'm, uh, I'm investing in Christchurch at the moment. At the moment, we're building the farmer's market um, in Cashel Mall, the Guthrie Centre beside Ballantyne's. We're actually doing um, eight heritage buildings beside the Mackenzie and Willis development in High Street. We've invested uh, heavily in Christchurch, and the reason I invested heavily in Christchurch is despite the when they um, announced the, the blueprint and seized half my land, 
I actually believed in the in the blueprint and the and, and you know the dream. I was sold the dream with the anchor projects and that sort of thing. And I could see a city that was going to be the best city, you know, in the world. You know, a brand new city and 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 set out with all of these anchor projects. You know, and and the, when I talk about the anchor projects, we have the you know we, we have the convention centre, the Open River Precinct, which I think is an amazing amazing anchor project, and the laneways and and that sort of thing. But for my from my point of view, the most critical one, the critical one, the most critical one is a multi-purpose arena. Now we've got an incredible opportunity. We've been gifted land in the city to build a multi-purpose arena and we've been given money to do it. You know, we don't get that. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to build the, I would say the best multi-purpose arena probably in the Southern Hemisphere, right in the CBD, connected by laneways and walkways to the terrace, to, to Little High, to, to all these things, you know, and. Um, I understand, you know, that the pressures and, and people wanting the money to be spent on other things, but basically we, we must have a vibrant CBD. You know, who pays for all the roads and all the, all the, all the infrastructure? It's a vibrant CBD. The, the rates, the way you, you, you have your rates, you charge commercial property a lot more rates than you do residential. If you don't have a vibrant CBD, you will not have the money to pay for the water, to pay for the roads. You know, the key thing is we need our engine, we need it running smoothly and we need it running well. And our CBD is that engine. And what's happening at the moment is we've got a, a, we're at a very, very delicate stage in the rebuild. You know, we've got a lot of good things happening in the library and the convention centre and I, I think the, um, the Hoyt Cinema is opening very soon. You know, our farmer's market's going to open in, in June. There's a few delays, I'm sorry, but they're con consent issues, but anyway. Um, <coughs> you know... So we've got lots of good things happening. But the problem is, and I just want to talk about the Dunedin Stadium. You know, the Dunedin Stadium, they spent $220 million. I hear people talk about how, you know, it's a noose around the neck of Dunedin and, and that sort of thing. You know, it pays $2 million a year in rent. And it's already bought into the economy $165 million. And that's six years after it was built. You know, if, if that's a disaster, can I have some of that? You know, seriously, I just don't understand how anyone can say that it hasn't been successful. Now, in the Ed Sheeran cons um, concerts that we had over Easter, you know, 35,000 Christchurch residents left town. 35,000 people. Now, the, the research is they spend between $500 and $600 each. So they spent $18 million of the money that was earned in Christchurch, and they spent that in Dunedin. The pink concert last weekend, you know, if you're on those same ratios, it's ten to 12,000 Christchurch residents left to go to pink. You know, that's another $6 million. We can't afford, every time there's a big concert in Auckland or Dunedin, to have everyone leave town and spend all the money. We can't afford it. People talk about whether we can afford the stadium. We can't afford not to build the stadium. If you don't build this multi-purpose arena, in the CBD, we will have lots of more restaurants and bars and cafes and retail things closing. Now, I deal with I deal with international retail tenants all the time, you know, and one of their major questions they ask me every time is, what are our tourist drivers? You know, what's bringing people into Christchurch? I can tell them that our busiest days at the airport is when people are leaving town. Our busiest days at the airport when there's a big concert in Dunedin, big concert in Auckland. How do I tell these retailers that yes, come in and spend your million dollars on fit out and set up a Louis Vuitton on this and that in the, in the high street when they know very well we don't have the tourist drivers? This one, one venue will change that. You know, uh, the Spark Arena in Auckland has, I think, um, last year had 77 events. 77 events. I went to the Robbie Williams concert. My partner booked a hotel. It was six, six or seven hundred dollars. So you've got to be joking. There must be cheaper accommodation than that. I went on that Travago and looked for accommodation. Unless I went two hours out of Auckland, I was paying five hundred dollars, and that's because of the demand. We, you know, we can get you can get a hotel room in Christchurch for under two hundred dollars. It's an indictment on the fact that we not we don't have enough things happening here. We've got to have this stadium, uh, multi-purpose arena. You know, um, the events this year that we could have had, you know, Ed Sheeran, Pink, Katy Perry, Depp, Robbie Williams, Bruno Mars, James Blunt, Imagine Dragons, Jimmy Barnes, Sher, Celine Dion, Adele, Shania Twain, Macklemore, Neil Diamond, Depp, it just goes on. And then you have and then you have the Warriors and the Phoenix and all that sort of thing. You know, people talk about it as a rugby stadium. It drives me mad. It's not a rugby stadium. It's a multi-purpose arena. The biggest impact will be from the concerts and the events. 
And, and, and you talk about the, you talk about, I've got young kids, and my young kids, they want to go to Dunedin, they want to go to Wellington, they go to Auckland. We need our city to be attractive for young kids, and the way to do that is to have the, the best concert venue in the country. And we can do that. We've been given the land. We've got the money. You know, we need to do that. I want my kids to go to Canterbury. Very selfish, but imagine if everyone's kids wanted to come to Canterbury. Maybe have people, imagine that, people from other centres wanting to send their kids to go to Canterbury University. It's almost unheard of. Everyone wants to go everywhere else. Um, you know, it, the, the cost of the Dunedin Stadium is $220 million, but the one thing I would, you know, the Westpac Trust Stadium, they built the stadium in, um, I think it was 2000, it was $100 million. But the thing is, that stadium now is effectively obsolete because it doesn't have a roof. So we've got the opportunity to build this amazing venue right into the CBD, and it's not about if we can afford it. I would be asking the question, can we afford not to do it? Because if we don't do it, the taxi drivers, the dairy owners, the retailers, the hospo, everybody is going to suffer. And people that are going to benefit is Auckland and Dunedin. And I heard someone say it's an arms race, and, well, you know, it, it is. And we're losing. We're unarmed. And we can't afford not to have this stadium. Um, you know, and I, I do appreciate, you know, the, the issues with the roading and all that sort of thing. And, you know, I've got my own theories about the priorities and things about where we should be spending our money. I see money spent on things every day, which I go, what the hell are we doing? But that's another argument. But the, the, the multi-purpose arena is essential infrastructure we must have. Must have. It's not a want. And if I hear someone else say it's a rugby stadium, I'll go absolutely mad. You know, we do have 19 rugby games, but if we have 20 concerts, and I, you know, this, I've spoken to the people that organise these concerts and I asked them about the pressures and the competition to get these concerts, we will have the best venue. We will get them. And I know the guys, that the promoters are saying, we will, we will fill that, but once a week you'll have a big event in that stadium. You imagine 30,000 people every week coming into the city spending at $618 million in the economy every week. We'll have money for the roads, we'll have money for the pools, we'll have money for everything else we want because our vibrant city will be paying a lot of rent which then transpires to capital value which transpires to rates. Without it, we won't have that money. Simple as that. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Um, have any councillors got any questions? Aaron? Yeah, just a, quite a simple one, Richard. When you decided to invest your um, essentially millions of dollars, which is, you could have given to your children or taken overseas at the time, post-quake, when you decided to invest that in the city, what was the timeline you were given for these major projects being open? Well, you because that must have affected your decision. Well, we, you know, straight after the quake, I had a business partner at the time. We, we sat in our office and we, we knew we were going to get a big insurance check we had to make a decision whether we were going to rebuild or take the money and run. And I, I'm a Christchurch lad, born and bred, you know, I love the city, and it, it was a very short decision, and we, we decided literally within hours that we were going to rebuild. Um, to be fair, a lot of our work that was done initially was wiped out by the blueprint two years later. But, you know, the, the timelines were clear. You know, no one ever thought it would take this long to do the, um, the major projects. You know, and to, to be honest, the rebuild's been driven by the by the likes of Nick Hunt and Goff and um, Carter. You know, without those guys, we'd be in deep. Mm. Well, I'm a, I'm a follower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th thank you very much for your presentation this morning. It's much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Let's build this. Next is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> Canterbury Employers Chamber of Commerce, uh, Leanne Watson and um, Michael Patterson. Oh, is it? Yes. Michael, Michael might come afterwards. Oh, is Michael? You can come down there. Yeah. Michael. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so, Leanne Watson, Chief Executive of the Canterbury Employers Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you've just heard from a very passionate Canterbrian who has shown bold, courageous leadership and invested millions in our central city. It's time now for our city's leaders, our council and each and every one of you sitting around the council table today to show that same bold, courageous leadership in your decision today. The Chamber supports the development of a stand-alone multi-use arena, 
the economic and social benefits that you've just heard about to the wider um, city and the wider region are a no-brainer. To the visitors of our economy and to the supporting our vibrant sporting and contemporary events calendar are considerable, as evidenced by some of the information that you've just heard from Richard. These benefits are even greater if the arena is capable of hosting both high-profile sports events, concerts, trade shows and major events. That is why our preference is that the arena has a roof and its location is in the residential east frame and the modern noise standards combined with the harsh Canterbury winters means its viability as a multi-use arena is limited but is not and is enclosed. It must be fit for purpose and it must ensure that we can host the many concerts that Richard has just outlined. It's also important that we have a venue large enough to allow Christchurch to compete for those top tier events. This means at a minimum a capacity of 30,000 to compare favourably with the other venues around the country. We believe that Christchurch should offer an experience to its residents that is comparable to other major cities and what would be expected of living in the second largest city here in New Zealand. A large concert and sports venue is a piece of public infrastructure in the same way that a concert hall for classical music is. The people of Christchurch should be able to see major sporting events and major musical events as the citizens of other major uh, cities in New Zealand have done for, for many years. The arena also provides a major event venue near the central city to support the hospitality and accommodation sector. The CBD has seen bold leadership and brave investment from those sectors leading our city's regeneration. And we must ensure that a vibrant city with a strong event, events culture and sports culture supports them in return. In a study last year, it was found that the Forsyth Bar Stadium had um, pumped 165 million into the city. We've just seen Dunedin again host the Pink Concert, and I was uh, very fortunate to attend that Pink Concert, and I can tell you, there were many women in particular down in Dunedin, and they didn't have one shopping bag, they had five. And the venues around, um, around Dunedin were very, very full. 34 million from Ed Sheeran. This is, um, this is um, dollars that we are missing out on. 35,000 people. Uh, leaving Christchurch for those sorts of stadiums. The impact on our hospitality providers, on our accommodation, on our retailers, particularly in the central city, is hurting. While stadiums tend not to cover their cost of capital, they do cover their operating costs when they are well run. And they are a major piece of the public infrastructure for the social and economic benefits of the city and the region and, in fact, the South Island. Today you have a choice on the decision that will become a legacy for our city and our region. Please ensure that the legacy is a positive one. And I just want to leave you with a, um, a quote that I um, just found. <laughs> All good men and women, also known as councillors, must take responsibility to create legacies that will take the next generation to a level we could only imagine. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, did you want to add? Um, well, I was called in last minute, um, and I have um, so, so I invited with me Bruce Garrett um, from the George. Olivier from the new Novotel at the airport, and Peter Morrison. Well, we've got the Hospitality Association next. Would you rather that you go with them? Well, I, I mean, um, all the information I've got, I'll just be repeating what Richard and Leanne have said, but I think that it's um, um, Brian Vitchley, who's very, um, has said to me, and I think he's probably said to, to many others, that it really is, it's the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker that are going to um, benefit from the stadium, and that's that succinctly wraps it up as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's, um, it's not just for the guys wearing the suits, it's for the people that work for us as well. And that's the... Mm. Thank you. All right, uh, Dion. So something else we're going to be discussing today around the central city momentum, um, getting people living in the central city, uh, the, the um, economic, you know, the heart of the city, you know, that vibrancy and that economic and also the events and stuff like that. So the decision that we've got to make on that, do you think also fits into the other decisions that we're making today? And um, you know, do you think the business community will be brought alongside and how do you think they can fit in and actually make this work for us as well? Oh, absolutely. A, a key part of um, the, the vibrancy of the central city is all of those things. So there is a, a balance um, of priorities around that. But if we don't have the stadium, um, as Richard very clearly articulated, the businesses in the central city will not exist. So a vibrant central city is made up of the business community. And those are the very people that have led the regeneration of our city. They've invested millions, billions uh, into the city. So we must support them. And that is a combination of events, uh, activation of things that will bring our residents back into the central city, some key marketing on changing the perception um, and some of the behaviours of our, of our central city. 
uh, making sure that we actually celebrate the wonderful uh, progress that we have made in the central city and bringing those people back in. So events is a key part of that as well. But and, the that's is the anchor. and that's directly what your members are saying to you. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Phil? Thanks, Leigh So just um, in response to um, what Dion was asking about the central city um, item in our agenda too, and j just from your comments now, are you really implying that, in fact, Christchurch Central City is at a tipping point? Absolutely. There are businesses who are hurting. Um, and as I said, th th these are the very businesses and the very organisations that have actually led our regeneration. So where we've got to to date um, is largely due to the private sector. Uh, and that we, we all know there are a lot of, a lot of reasons as to why. Uh, so these businesses are at a crucial point, as is our central city. Glenn? Thank you, Leanne. What then, on the back of that, um, do you feel is sufficient for the business sector? A signal today, because obviously it's going to take, if we proceed with the stadium along or multi-use and arena, a long time to build. So, is the strength of a signal sufficient for? Look, I think that the um, that, that decision is absolutely crucial. I think uh, if if the wrong decision is made today, we will absolutely see others in the central city making the wrong decisions. Um, and that will be a huge disaster for this city. And not only the city, but actually New Zealand. Um, so this has a flow on impact wider than, wider than uh, Christchurch and Canterbury. It has a flow on impact into New Zealand. It has an impact on the uh, confidence in our city from um, across New Zealand, but also internationally. So I think the other, um, the other part of the equation is actually looking at how we can activate things between now and when the multi-use arena stadium does come on board. So. You know, there's some work being done around um, looking at how we do some of those things in the central city, some marketing, some, some key events to bring people into the, back into the central city. So that has to run in parallel. And, and may I just add, you know, I think we're, we're seeing that um, we are flying in formation, um, you know, that there is a, our, our sector now believes in Christchurch NZ and, and our, um, um, our promotional organisation. Uh, we need that horizon. We need that. We need to understand how far away that stadium is, mm -hmm. so that we can survive. So that we can c keep the momentum and the enthusiasm, um, and, and potentially see um, further hotel development. Um, but but if if we can't see that happening, um, gosh, it's going to be really tough. Yeah. Yanni, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just wondered if uh, we've had previous deputations around the people should have a say. What's your view on whether the public and the people of Christchurch should have a say in regards to how the 300 million is allocated? Look, it's, it's really important that the people of Christchurch are involved in the regeneration of our city. There's no doubt about that. But there is also a time for the council to show that bold, courageous leadership, and that is today. So we, we can have the, uh, the people of Christchurch, and they have been involved across many different platforms um, in the regeneration of our city, but there comes a time where there has to be that bold leadership from our council, and that's today. Thank you. Look, thank you very much, Leanne, Phil, Michael. Um, thanks for coming along. Thank you. And uh, the uh, last deputation that we have is on the, from the Hotel Association and Hospitality Industry. So uh, with me today I've got um, uh, Bruce Garrett, the General Manager of the George Hotel, and uh, Peter Morrison, who is the President of the um, Hospitality Association of um, Canterbury. Um, and I suppose the, the thing is that what we can add to this now is actually uh, the answering of questions. Peter would, um, I think we should allow Peter to speak first, and then um, uh, Bruce is a great statistical man. He'll have all the answers for you, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, you all know me anyway, but I'm, j I'm just here in support of the stadium going ahead, the Model Purpose Arena. You've heard all the facts and figures from Richard Pebbles, a great developer in this city. But we're, we're going to lose those people. We're going to lose businesses. We've already had bars and restaurants close. The last two winters have been disastrous. Um, as you know, this stadium was meant to be... Uh, uh, the multi-purpose stadium was meant to be here by now. The convention centre was meant to be here by now. 
we can't talk in the past, we've got to talk for the future. That is the biggest attraction that is going to keep people here. Some of our people are already talking about leaving the city, and I think Richard brought up uh, about the university. If we don't have this thing, this um, multi-purpose arena, that won't work either. Um, Michael referred to the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. That was actually from me, not Brian Vitchley. I've always said, uh. I've always <laughs> said that it's, everyone thinks it's just hospitality, but it's not. It's um, the service station owner that sells petrol to the taxi that's busy because he's taking people to the arena. It's the vegetable, the hydroponic vegetable grower out in Horsville that sells more lettuces to the hotels and the restaurants when it's busy. So it goes right through, right to the bottom. It employs students. We're the biggest employer of students in, in Christchurch. And it's, I'm so emotional about it. It's just that we've got to get, this has to happen. And um, someone asked the question, uh, do you think, I think it was Yanni, do the peop, uh, do we need to go back to the people? We don't need to go back to the people. We've had so many discussions over the last two or three years about this. Um, and also that we vote you people in to make the decisions. It's in your hands. And I really, really want to tell you we need this arena to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to add a couple of things, certainly um, reinforce everything that um, that Richard and the Anne said. That, um, I thought they spoke uh, very well in terms of the, the facts and things. Um, just some other aspects of it. Um, obviously, in order for... Um, a city to be able to afford to operate, it needs to be thriving, it needs to be growing, it needs that economic momentum happening. As has been explained, um, the multi-purpose arena uh, is a really key element of that. Um, and, it's, and it does support um, right through these, these um, uh, sort of major infrastructure items, really do support right through the economy, right through the local community. Um, what is not um, appreciated by many people is that Christchurch is very, very seasonal. Um, we are the most seasonal major centre in the, in the country, more so than Auckland, more so than Wellington, more so than Queenstown. Um, in winter, um, everything just goes very, very quiet, which makes all of those businesses really hard to operate. Um, and they are closing. We will lose them, um, which means that then they won't be around. We won't have the retail. We won't have the hospitality. We won't have the hotels to accommodate people when we want them and when we, and when we need them. Um, so um, the, yeah, we have some fantastic things going for the city, but we need to have the whole picture. We're losing ground at the moment, all the other major centres. Um, indication from the hotels, um, occupancy rates, um, average room rates have been static for the last seven years. Every other major centre in New Zealand has been growing. Um, which is a sign of those economies growing. Um, the airport uh, is hosting more numbers are coming through Christchurch Airport now um, than pre-quake, which is fantastic. But they're not staying in Christchurch. They're disappearing all over the rest of the South Island, and the rest of the South Island is benefiting. Um, we were, um, we still are the major gateway, but that is all we're becoming. Um, we need people to stay here. We need them to, we, those visitors to spend their money here so that then we can use it for the things that we need as, as a city, to pay for the water and the roads and the social housing and the, and the well-being of the community. If we just only have the money that we already have, we're not going to be able to afford those things. We need to attract money from outside to come into the city so that we can develop and expand those things. Right, so I, I think we're well placed to answer questions. Sure. And I, mean, I think the message we're trying to give you here is that we're, with, with the knowledge of when the, when the um, um, stadium will be here, we can hang on, but only just. And that's, um, we, we need to know when that's going to happen, and we need to know it's going to happen. Yeah. All right. Um, do I have any questions? Uh, Glenn? Yeah, thank you, and thank you for that. And thank you for mentioning, or acknowledging rather, uh, social housing. So in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, we would see that uh, obviously, um, you know, to be sheltered, to be fed, uh, to be housed sits at, the, at the, the bottom of that pyramid and something hugely aspirational such as a multi-use arena sits at the top. So it would be good to get a uh, bearing from you in terms of how you see uh, the needs and the wants of the city 
uh, coming together and whether you in fact see these as a are they some kind of false dichotomy or do they all belong together I I think it sort of reminds me of the, of the story, you know, give a man to fish and you'll feed him for a day, teach him how to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime. So if you spend that money now on things uh, such as roads and, and so basically that's all there's ever going to be and it's going to be gone. If we invest in things that are going to stimulate the economy and keep money coming in um, for the future, uh, for future generations, then we will be able to afford those things. So... Uh, Obviously, those um, things like social housing and well-being and those things, I mean, they're critical. And as you say, they're, they're right at the, at the bottom of, of that pyramid. But we need to look to the future and ensure that we can continue to pay for those things uh, going forward. Can I follow up? Yep. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess you would, though, see uh, everything as part of a system in a city and that housing itself is a system of which social housing is a part, so would you entertain the, the notion that uh, actually investing in social housing is that it's an investment as well? And, and um, it, 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 it's also a social and economic... Yes, yeah. it, it's, a, um, it's a multiplier of its own as well. Um, yeah, I acknowledge that, yes, it is a system and it, and it, is, um, it is going to create its own um, advantages, but... Is a, but not, uh, I, yeah, I don't believe as quickly and clearly as um, as investing in some of this this other infrastructure um, will do in being able to attract outside money and multiply that effect. I think does the issue come back to the cost sharing agreement as was identified before that it had this um, two hundred and um, it had a it had a massive gap in it <laughs> um, of a you know, 217 million or something was 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 missing from the from the project as to be determined, and I think there were, might have been an unrealistic expectation at the time. I mean, I didn't sign the agreement, but um, that the amount would come from the private sector. But what I guess we're being offered here is that the the crown will meet the difference um, on the basis that this will give certainty to the project, which would support the people that have already invested on the basis that it's coming. That it's coming. Definitely. Uh, there's, I mean, there's been a lot of investment, you've heard from Richard yeah. uh, before, um, anticipating these things happen. There's a, there's a lot of hotel projects um, underway now. Um, that, uh, and, and we've already seen in the hospitality space the number of restaurants that have really been struggling, the number of motels that have been struggling. As Peter said, the worst couple of winters um, we've just experienced, and they're only going to get worse unless we have some things that are going to um, bring in visitors, uh, particularly during that um, the quieter uh, winter season. And it's not... Um, and, it, and it's not all about a couple of wealthy developers, sustaining a couple of wealthy developers. It's all the people they employ and then all the money that mm. that puts back into the economy and right, right through um, everywhere. People won't be able to afford to pay their rent because they won't have a job. And um, it's, you know, it's going to put more pressure on, on social housing. Um, and the, yeah, the, w the one thing we can promise, the one social out major social outcome we can promise out of this is jobs. All right. Well, that's, that, that's the other pyramid. Yeah. Converse to yours. The jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look, thank, thank you very much and thank appreciate you. you coming in. Um, we're going to adjourn now for morning tea. Um, so if, um, if people could be back here seated at the table ready to go at 10.50. Thank you.